Their singer has been arrested multiple times for drink driving, assault, battery and disorderly conduct, and was even charged with vehicular manslaughter when he was found to be responsible for the death of a fellow musician and friend. Their bass player, a heroin addict, had overdosed several times before the band even saw the decade of the 90s and on one occasion in 1987 was declared clinically dead for over two minutes before paramedics brought him back from the beyond. The drummer was arrested in 1997 for instigating a riot, amongst other things, and the guitar player would be struck down in his prime by a crippling, lifelong, chronically painful health condition. From any normal person's perspective, this sounds more like the tales and fantasy of an overly dramatized Hollywood film. But for the people that lived it, it could not have been more real. Death, danger, drugs and heartbreak would be the muse for this raucous, death-defying act from Los Angeles, California. They would become notorious for popularizing the bad boy image into the world of heavy metal. Boys wanted to be them and women wanted to bed them. Girls, bikes, booze and illegal narcotics would be their fuel and the music would bring them their fame. They would shock the world with the release of their breakthrough record Shout at the Devil in 1983, which would become one of the instigators for the nationwide moral uprising of the so-called Satanic Panic that swept the United States of America, alarming parents across the country to the apparent widespread adoption of Satanic ritual abuse amongst teenagers. This wasn't just another band, this was a global phenomenon on a scale of which people had never seen before. This is Smoking in the Boys Room, the story of Motley Crue. Led Zeppelin, and the next song would be Olivia Newton-John, and then it would be some new band uh, called Aerosmith doing a Yardbirds cover, and then there would be Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. So my mind was trained very early to, to be open. Nikki Six, born Frank Farana, December the 11th, 1958, in San Jose, California would come from what you could call the classic American broken home. Raised by his single mother, who was just 19 when she gave birth to him, often spent more time partying than mothering, and also raised by his grandparents after his father left the family. Six had spent many years trying to figure out what happened to his father. He seemed to have just abandoned the family when Nikki was very young, too young to even remember. I fell in love with drugs and alcohol for the first time when I was just six years old. By that time, I had accepted the fact that I would never have a real dad. But it's no secret my mum didn't have a problem bringing men around to try and fill that void, even if it was for herself and not me. It's clear that his upbringing, or lack of, not only had a profound impact on his formative years, but it would shape his life and addictions for many years to come. Around the age of 15 though, Six would discover what you could call some of his heroes. He remembers hearing Iggy and the Stooges for the first time on the radio. Search and Destroy was the song, and the lyrics would become ever so fitting for his lifestyle. I'm a street walking cheetah with a heart full of napalm. I'm a runaway son on the nuclear A bomb. I'm the world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. In 1973, it was all about glam. The New York Dolls released their first record, and they would quickly become his new infatuation as he tried his hardest to imitate his new idol, Johnny Thunders, guitarist for the band. Nicky also saw Alice Cooper as an idol, but also became heavily invested with the likes of Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, Sex 
Sex Pistols, and even the Ramones. But it was the flamboyant outfits and styles of the New York Dolls that would truly shape his early image, and ultimately lead Six to dreaming about becoming a rock star. He would attend Roosevelt High School during 10th grade after moving to Seattle. Once I got over to Roosevelt High School, all the kids I was hanging out with, they played instruments, they looked cool. There were places to buy cool clothes. There were hangout areas in the university district. That was such a cool hang in the 70s. I felt like I came alive in Seattle. To be honest with you, everything that I loved was there. Here, Nikki would become friends with Rick Van Zandt, the same Rick Van Zandt that would join Metal Church many years later. Six was so desperate to be in any band that he even stole a guitar, thinking it was a bass, in order to join a band with Rick. That, however, didn't quite work out. Nikki would move to Los Angeles in the late 70s and would soon join a band called Sister with Lizzie Gray, Dane Rage, and Blackie Lawless, the very same Blackie Lawless that would go on to form Wasp. But this didn't last long. After recording a demo tape in South Bay, Blackie, not surprisingly, fired Six and Grey, who decided to form their own band called London. November 7th, 1980, Frank Ferrana Jr. officially changes his name to Nicky Six. He toyed with the idea of calling himself Nicky London or Nicky Nine, but instead he decided to basically steal someone else's stage name. A cover band called Squeeze from Riverdale, their singer Jeff Nicholson went by the name Nicky Six, which he took from the license plate of a Mercedes, N-I-K-I Six. Nicky just changed the spelling. His new band London would become hugely popular amongst the Hollywood scene and gave Nicky his first real taste of being a rock star. However, due to tensions within the band, this wouldn't last long. Nicky Six knew he was on to something big, so he decided to leave London and start something new, reinvent himself and his band. And that band would be Motley Crue. Motley Crue would officially form on January the 17th, 1981, shortly after they would play their first show on April the 24th in the same year. This would take place at the Starwood Club in West Hollywood. The club itself was owned by a criminal mastermind called Eddie Nash, who was involved in the Wonderland murders a couple of months after Motley first took to the stage there. So it seemed crew started out in dangerous hands to begin with. A lot of people's lives are really boring. And that's what, that's what Motley Crue is about. We want to make people's lives more fun. So when you come to our concert, you have fun. Nikki Six, Tommy Lee, Mick Mars and Vince Neil would become known as Motley Crue. And they would spend the next several years wreaking havoc, not just on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, but across the nation. Tommy Lee was born in Athens, Greece, October 3rd, 1962. He would be heavily influenced by Tommy Aldridge, an American heavy metal and hard rock drummer who played for the likes of Ozzy Osbourne, the Pat Travers Band, and Whitesnake. Tommy Lee was given his first set of drumsticks when he was just four years old and eventually dropped out of high school to pursue a career in music. It would be him and Nicky who would start jamming together after Nicky's former band, London, had fallen by the wayside. Vince Neil, born Vincent Neil Wharton, was already a Californian child by heart, being born in the Queen of Angels Hospital in Los Angeles County, February 8th, 1961. Vince would also be introduced to danger at a very early age. In August of 1965, a large-scale race riot that lasted six days took place in south-central LA, something Neil says he remembers vividly. 34 people died during these riots. Vince didn't exactly come from any type of musical family. There were no musicians in his household to show him the ropes. He never attended any singing lessons or school choir. I never even sang in the shower. Nobody in my family sings. I never took a lesson. I never knew what I was doing. Basically, I faked it from the jump. 
I had the act down, all I needed was the voice to go with it. It was all about the attitude. Neil would end up in a covers band called Rock Candy during high school, singing hits from ACDC, Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Cheap Trick, and Aerosmith. They would start playing in people's backyards or house parties, and often would be shut down by the police due to noise complaints. For me, in high school, being in a band meant free beer and steady supply of girls. That's why I was into it. Girls wanted to get with the guys on stage, especially the singer. That was pretty much it. What else was important in high school? Mick Mars being the oldest member of the group, born Robert Allen Deal, May 4th, 1951 in Indiana, moving to Garden Grove, California around the age of nine. By the time he was 14, he joined his first band, a Beatles cover act called The Jades. Mars started playing the guitar around the age of seven years old, if you can even call it a guitar. He managed to get his hands on a 1950s Mickey Mouse wind-up guitar, far different from the classical Fender Stratocaster you would most likely see him with nowadays. Mars's main inspirations, like many guitarists that grew up during the 60s and 70s, would be Jeff Beck, <laughs> Hendrix, and Eric Clapton. However, Mick's big guitar hero was Mike Bloomfield. Bloomfield was an American guitarist from Chicago, Illinois, who rose to fame in the 60s as a prominent blues rock musician. And if you listen to Motley Crue songs, it's quite easy to hear the prominent influence of traditional blues music within many of Mick Mars's riffs, despite Crue becoming known as an influential glam and heavy metal band. November 10th, 1981, Motley Crue released their debut studio album, Too Fast For Love. The cover alone was enough to cause concern for any God-fearing American family. With Vince Neil's leather-clad crotch on display, accessorized with studded bracelets, a spiked belt, and a very subtle devil horn hand gesture. Not to mention handcuffs that many would interpret as a nod to bondage. Not exactly the type of album cover you'd want to find in your kid's bedroom. Motley Crue, though, were all about shock value and promptly ditched their almost clean aesthetic they adopted at first to full-on devil-worshipping imagery and demonic-looking outfits. Whilst Livewire would be the lead single from the record, this album also contained a song that would cause some conflict with Six's previous band, London. The song in question was called Public Enemy No. 1. Nicky's old bandmate and best friend, Lizzie Gray, said he was surprised to see this song on Motley Crue's first record, saying it was a song he solely wrote for London, yet he only received a small credit on Crue's debut album, as well as Six also crediting himself on the song. Public Enemy No. 1, though, became a crowd favourite. The song would also ironically represent the band's mantra for years to come, as their out-of-control rock and roll antics made them the focal point of what you could call a modern-day witch hunt. Although Too Fast for Love wasn't an instant commercial success, the Quaalude-loving quartet would waste no time making their presence known to the police and border authorities during one of their first tours. 1982 would see Crew marked down to play eight shows across Canada. However, at some point during this tour, they were quite literally kicked out of the country. It was great because we were so young, we didn't know. We got kicked out of Canada, and I remember at the time, we were like, good fucking riddance. We were happy. We looked up to the Sex Pistols. We were like, wow, great. We got thrown out of our first country. Now, whilst it wasn't the first time a band had encountered legal issues whilst crossing the border on a tour, such as Lemmy from Motorhead being arrested at the Canadian border in 1975 when he was still with Hawkwind, this early incident involving Motley Crue would be nothing short of child's play compared to the widespread chaos they would embark upon throughout the rest of the decade. Chaos that would cost lives. 
Satanism. Devil worship is being practiced all across the country. We have all types of perversion going on, and it's affecting America. During the early 80s, a number of bands within the heavy metal genre were gaining popularity amongst the younger generation for their aggressive and unruly behavior. Some, however, were becoming known as the devil's music. Musicians that either embraced Satanism and the occult, or just outright went hell crazy singing about Lucifer. Black Sabbath and Coven are two early examples of groups that were deemed to be Satanist. Black Sabbath, of course, well known as the founders of heavy metal, developed quite an intense following of fans that actively practiced various aspects of the occult. And Coven, an American outfit from Chicago forming in 1967, are believed to be the first hard rock band to feature the devil horn hand gesture on their album artwork, whilst also depicting inverted crosses, skulls, and even ritual sacrifice. Then you have the new wave of British heavy metal movement that saw the likes of Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Diamond Head, and others that many God-fearing families would also deem to be satanic to some extent, or at least a bad influence on the kids embracing their music. Most parents, though, would see these obsessions more akin to teenage rebellion as opposed to ritual sacrifice. Motley Crue, however, would take it one step further. September 23rd, 1983, the second studio album from Crue would hit the shelves. It would become one of the most controversial LPs of the decade. Shout at the Devil would sell over 200,000 copies in its first two weeks, becoming the band's breakthrough record. It featured a large black pentagram on the front cover, with blood-red text for the band name and record title. Although not the first release to feature such imagery, Venom's debut offering in 1981 also donned a pentagram. However, it didn't see the same level of commercial success. From Shout at the Devil, Crew would release three singles, Looks That Kill, Halter Scalter, and Too Young to Fall in Love. <laughs> The kill would help to cement Motley Crue's early reputation for siding with Satanism and devil worship. Pentagrams, chains, studs, and fire, along with their hellish looks, would all contribute to the hell raising image that would terrify parents across the nation. Their new fame drew attention from religious groups and even a small feature in an ABC news special in 1985 called The Devil Worshippers. And finally, music which is found here in the neighborhood record store under the category of heavy metal music. The satanic message is clear, both in the album covers and in the lyrics, which are reaching impressionable young minds. This news report would coincide with the founding of the PMRC, an American committee formed by Tipper Gore that targeted several groups, including Motley Crue, Judas Priest, ACDC and Merciful Fate, amongst others, accusing them of exposing teenagers and vulnerable youngsters to violence, drug use, sexual themes, and even satanic ritual abuse. Whilst the intentions of the PMRC were to censor the likes of Crew, all it did was shine a light on how dangerous they really were. For Motley Crue, though, this was the biggest and probably most successful free marketing campaign they could have hoped for, as kids everywhere rushed to buy their records and be at the front row of every concert. Motley Crue were now headline news. They had become heavy metal gods, but the fame and fortune would very quickly turn to death and despair. <laughs> The 1980s would not only see Motley Crue become one of the biggest metal bands of a generation, but the very same decade would also usher in their downfall, as the band entered a downward spiral of personal struggles and reckless behavior. November 14th, 1984, a Finnish band called Hanoi Rocks, often cited as the main influence for Guns N' Roses, were embarking on their first set of American tour dates. 
Starting out at the Salty Dog Saloon in New York, they would complete 17 dates in total, with the last show taking place on December the 3rd, 1984. On December the 8th, members of Hanoi Rocks and Motley Crue were partying together at one of their houses. Of course, everyone was heavily intoxicated by the time they had ran out of alcohol. But being rock stars, the party naturally had to continue. Vince Neil decided to take his Tommaso Pantera sports car to the liquor store and joining him would be Hanoi Rocks drummer, Nicholas Charles Dingley, also known as Razzle, who was in fact an English musician. This would be the last trip he would take. On their way back, Vince Neil would lose control of his highly tuned sports car whilst heavily under the influence of alcohol, resulting in a head-on collision with another vehicle. Not only was Razzle killed instantly, both occupants of the other vehicle sustained brain damage and were severely injured. Razzle was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital shortly after. Vince Neil's punishment? Sentenced to 30 days in prison, but released early on good behavior. Or that was the story at the time anyway. It would later be revealed the reason Vince was given such a light sentence was simple. Money. He could afford the best lawyers money could buy, and that's exactly what he did. He wrote the court to check for $2.5 million. I wrote a $2.5 million check for vehicular manslaughter when Razzle died. I should have gone to prison. I definitely deserved to go to prison. But I did 30 days in jail and got laid and drank beer, because that's the power of cash. Despite this being made headline news and heavily televised, even showing Vince Neil in court, he got away with it. But this was simply just seen as part of the rock star lifestyle. You can do whatever you want and face little to no consequences. The show will simply go on, or for some people, it did anyway. Vince Neil was simply allowed to continue with Motley Crue as if nothing ever happened, and he would dedicate the band's 1985 record Theatre of Pain to the memory of Razzle, which offered little in the way of solace to those close to him. Although Theatre of Pain was a commercial success, landing the band a top 10 Billboard chart position, death this time was about to come knocking directly at Motley Crue's door. December 23rd, 1987, bassist and founding member of the band, Nikki Six would be declared clinically dead. Alcohol, acid, cocaine, they were just affairs. When I met heroin, it was true love. Nikki had developed a long-standing addiction to many substances over the years, but heroin would be the one that nearly took his life indefinitely. On this occasion, he was lucky. By the late 80s, he claims that he had already overdosed on this drug several times, once even having his body thrown into a dumpster. But two days before Christmas in 1987, he almost became just another dead rock star. I was at the Franklin Plaza apartments in Hollywood, shooting up between snorts of cocaine and shots of booze. It was late December 1987. Motley Crue had just released our record, Girls, 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 and we were about to tour the world. From the outside looking in, I was living the dream, but in reality, I was in the throes of a disease I couldn't control, addicted to heroin. Nikki Six doesn't remember much from that night, only that someone had to call paramedics. He would wake up in the back of an ambulance and would later be told that he was declared clinically dead for two minutes. Nikki Six had seemingly done the impossible. He died and came back from the dead. This quite literally should have been the nail in the coffin for Motley Crue's career, although that wasn't far off in any case. The latter part of this decade was essentially the end of Motley Crue as we would know them. Girls, Girls, Girls released in 1987 and Dr. Feelgood in 1989 would be for many the last great records that Crue would ever release. Along with this, tensions within the group came to a breaking point. In 1992, Vince and Motley Crue would part ways with each other, 
Still to this day, Vince says he was fired and Nikki Six said he quit. Neil would be replaced by John Karabi, who wasn't exactly a well-known name at the time. Having only released one studio album with his LA band The Scream in 1991, although they quickly disbanded in 93. Karabi would only release one LP with Motley Crue, which would be their sixth studio album, a self titled record released March 15th, 1994. Although it hit number seven on the Billboard charts, Motley Crue could no longer pull in a live audience. We were going to show them without a frontman dancing in the spotlight, we could play heavy four piece rock and roll like never before. And we were going to challenge them with the lyrics and images about fascism and stereotyping that would blow their minds. We were going to do whatever we wanted because after all, we were Motley Crue. On the opening night of their tour as the new crew in Tucson, Arizona, they were scheduled to play a 15,000 seat amphitheater. However, they sold a mere 4,000 tickets. Nikki Six even went on a local radio show to offer anyone that showed up to the concert free entry. Only two people took up the offer. If I had said that in 1989, there would have been 10,000 teenagers rioting in the parking lot. That afternoon, two Mexican kids showed up, and that's when I realized it was all over. According to reports, the record label refused to fund any further recordings until Vince Neil was reinstated as the lead singer. During this time, Vince had actually had some commercial success as a solo artist, releasing two albums, Exposed in 1993 and Carved in Stone in 1995. Vince also instructed his lawyers to sue Motley Crue for 25% of future Crue profits and $5 million in damages for firing him. Although Vince had found a new passion in his solo career, tragedy was just around the corner. His daughter Skylar would sadly lose her life on August the 15th, 1995. She died of cancer at the age of just four years old. This trauma greatly contributed to the ultimate downfall of Vince Neil's mental health and continuing struggles with addiction over the coming years. Vince and Motley Crue would however reunite in 1997, but it seemed the damage was already done. They had tarnished their reputation and the fans had quite simply had enough. Whilst Motley Crue have continued to release music and tour during the past couple of decades, it just hasn't quite been the same. Motley Crue's story is much more than what is on show here. They followed a 40-year career that led them down a path of death, destruction, and absolute debauchery. And of course, with the current legal issues between the band and Mick Mars, which just adds more fuel to their ever-dying fire, it would seem that Motley Crue no longer shout at the devil, rather just at each other. Mm -hmm.